Hi, everyone. Can uh, everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My wife will be joining here in a, in a moment to help field questions and all that. Uh, but just to try to stay on time, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first uh, slide today, we're going to talk about uh, queen care and um, introducing a new queen, reasons you might want to introduce a new queen, and all those sorts of things. Um, so one reason you might want to introduce a new queen is if your queen that was in your hive uh, either died or just stopped uh, laying eggs or, or dramatically slowed egg laying to the point that, that um, she can't keep the colony growing. Um, another reason you might want to is if your bees are... Sorry. Oh, one second. All right. Uh, another reason you might want to replace your queen, sorry about that, is if uh, your bees are really aggressive um, because that's a genetic trait. And if um, if you allow it to persist, not only will that colony be aggressive, but um, other new colonies when your queen goes out to your new queen goes out to mate, uh, will mate with drones from that aggressive or could mate with drones from that aggressive colony. And then you could end up just spreading aggression throughout your apiary. Um, if you were in the country and you just you don't you don't really care if they're aggressive, um, then that's that's fine. But I live in like a suburban area where I, I can't have any aggression because there's people that are around. So um, so I keep a close close eye on that. And if if a if a colony is aggressive, I uh, pretty quickly replace the queen. Um, another reason you might want to introduce a new queen is if you're splitting a colony into two. And uh, someone asked me to cover this topic, so we'll go into splitting here in a second. But if you um, if you wanted to grow your apiary and you wanted to um, turn one robust colony in the spring, say, if you wanted to turn it into two colonies, you could actually do that. And um, one way of doing that is to um, split the colony in two and then give the the uh, the half of the colony that doesn't have a queen anymore, uh, give them a new uh, queen to take over that half of the colony because that will be a brand new colony all on its own. So those are reasons you might want to. Now, ways of doing it, there's a, a lot of ways, um, but the few most common ones, uh, actually, I think, uh, number two on here is the most common for me. I prefer to um, to introduce an, a caged mated queen. Uh, they cost forty dollars, so it's kind of pricey. Um, but the reason I do that is I think it's actually worth the money because um, the other option, option number one here, is to let queen let uh, a colony raise their own new queen, so that they will. Um, you just basically make sure they have um, access to eggs. Um, so as we talked about last time, eggs are eggs for three days only, and then they turn into larvae. So they need eggs to raise up a new queen. Um, so if you want them to raise their own, you have to they have to have a frame that has eggs in it, and then they can turn one of those worker eggs into a, a queen cell. Um, and that is free. They can raise it on their own for free. But the reason I prefer the, the caged queen is because... Um, there's a it takes a long time for them to raise up a new queen and for her to go on a mating flight and then to return and then mature enough to start laying eggs. So you're looking at 16 days just for them to raise the queen and then it can take a couple weeks for um, her to go out on her mating flight and then um, and then return. So you're talking several weeks before she even starts laying eggs. And then once she starts laying eggs, those workers will take another 21 days to develop. So you just have this huge gap in your in your brood cycle. So that's why I prefer the 
to buy a queen that's already mated. She's already um, fully developed and ready to start laying eggs because it gets rid of that gap. But I will say one of the perks to letting them raise their own is that when you um, when you cause that break in the brood cycle, um, mites go down a lot because that's where mites, we'll talk about this soon when we get to Varroa, but uh, mites actually reproduce inside of capped brood cells. So if there are no capped brood cells, they can't reproduce. So that that is one perk to letting them raise their own is you're, you're basically enforcing a brood break so that um, mites cannot reproduce. And that's a really good mite treatment um, that doesn't involve any chemicals. So um, a third option is a sealed queen cell. So if you have one hive that's getting ready to swarm and they have all these swarm cells, um, that they're they're raising up a lot of times they'll have so many you might find a couple dozen inside of a, a hive that's preparing to swarm you can actually if you have another hive that needs a queen you can actually take one of those if you're very careful take it and uh, you can actually place it inside between the frames uh, of a hive that needs a queen and they'll actually a lot of times accept the queen the acceptance rate isn't quite as high uh, i was actually freshening up on the percentages last night i think they say it's like 50 to 60 percent of um sealed queens uh virgin queens are accepted and it's um i want to say 80 to 95 or something percent of of mated queens are accepted um so it, that's an option there's also sometimes people who um who will have virgin queens that haven't gone out on their mating flights and they'll sell them to you for a little bit cheaper than um, what a mated queen costs. And that's kind of the best of both worlds, I guess you get, uh, she hasn't gone on her mating flight, but she, at least you don't have to wait 16 days for her to emerge and all those things. So that's another option. Um, so when you want, when you go to introduce a new queen, uh, you want to make sure that the colony that you're introducing the new queen to really doesn't have a queen because if if they do have a queen then uh it's a it's pretty likely that your queen will actually your existing queen will kill the new queen um and the the colony will be on her side because she already is their queen um sometimes when you go in, you have to like, if, if the queen is still there at all, if, if she's already gone, you can just go in and, and um, put the new queen in. But if uh, she's still in, in the hive, you have to remove her. And um, most people uh, just kill them right away. Um, although I've, this is a totally different tangent, but I've, um, I have hung on to queens for a couple of days and tried them in a different colony to see what they do. But um, yeah, most people just uh, get rid of the queen and replace them with the new queen. And some people wait for a couple hours just to let the the queen pheromones kind of dip down and, and let the new new queen have this um, this uh, period where she's like accepted more likely. But um, I don't I don't really feel like that's necessary. Whenever I put in a new queen, I usually do it right after I remove the old queen and they seem to accept her just fine. Um, let's see. So um, yeah, here's another point. If, if you if you put the queen cage screen side up, I should have had a queen cage here with me. But if you put it queen side or screen side up on top of the frames, a lot of times you can see how they react to her, which is kind of a good sign um, it's a good way to tell if, if they are, um, looking for a new queen. So it's very normal for them to crawl all over the, the queen cage. As soon as you set it on top of the frames, what is not normal and not a good sign is if they're sort of rolling up their abdomens and trying to sting the queen through the, the screen. Um, that could be a sign that they're for whatever reason, um, not likely to accept her she's still protected by that screen so you can um you can put it in there and and give them a few days to see how they see if they calm down um, but usually most of the time they just crawl all over it they'll kind of um, use their antennae to uh communicate with the the queen through the screen and that's all all a good sign let's see and then when you're putting the queen cage in 
Um, you kind of do it the same way you would do it. We talked about last time when you're putting a, a new queen in a new hive where you kind of sandwich it between two frames with the the um, the hole up facing up where the queen has to crawl out so that the if the attendant bees that are in there taking care of her if they die and fall to the bottom of the of the cage they don't block the exit so just like you would on uh, when you're introducing it to a new hive uh, you would remove the cork that exposes the candy plug and then place it upright with the hole facing up and sometimes when you're when you're this far into the season and you're replacing an existing queen, a lot of times the comb is built out enough that you don't actually need to rubber band it to the to the frame because the comb is built out. You can kind of just tuck it down in there. And some people even just leave it sitting um, face up on top of the on top of the frames and they'll put like a, a shim over top to give it a little space for the bees to crawl on top of it. Um, but there's a few different ways to do that. Those are the the basics for that. Um, after five to seven days, they should be able to chew through that fondant, and uh, you can go out and check on them. And usually, what I do is, if um, at that point, if they haven't already released her on their own, but they are still treating her nicely, crawling all over the the cage and all that. I will just go ahead and release the queen myself. It's called a direct release. There's a cork on the other side of the cage that's not blocked by fondant. You can remove that cork and just literally set it out on top of the frames and she'll just crawl down in. And um, and then you know that your queen is safely inside and, and can start laying eggs. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and as I mentioned at the bottom here, um, you might give her a, a little time to um, acclimate before checking back after you release her after she's after you know she's in there. Maybe give her like ten days or so, um, because as I mentioned in the previous um, section, there's uh, a period at the beginning where they're very vulnerable. The queen's very vulnerable. It's almost like the colony is looking for a reason to to get rid of her. Um, if there's anything weird with her, they'll, a lot of times they'll just kill her. So, yeah, I usually wait about 10 days after releasing a queen before going back in um, and doing anything with her. That includes marking her or even just checking on the colony. There's not really a good reason to check on them anytime real soon because, you know, they're not going to be swarming because she, she's just starting to lay um and you know they have plenty of space because they can't build everything out that quickly um so that's so i would wait 10 days and then when you do go to mark her we talked a little bit about this on the last one as well um there's a queen cage and i'll, I'll show you a little video here in a second of how i do it but i showed you the queen cage uh last last week um where i'm I put the cage around the queen and kind of trap her on the on the frame and then mark her with the marker. And there's these little paint markers. There's a bunch of different brands. Um, one of these I got from my local bee guy. The other guy, the other one I got from uh, Better Bee. Any beekeeping shop should have these. They're just little paint markers. Um, I think they cost like $8. Uh, and, and the colors are color-coded. So... Um, this year it'll be green because any year that ends in four or nine would be green. And so since it's 2024, it's going to be green this year. Um, and then next year, 2025, it'll be blue. And then we'll start back at the beginning. Um, for 2026, it'll be white and then so on. And this just allows you to keep track of how old your queens are. Um, most people will replace them after a couple of years because they start declining in productivity. Um, and a lot of times the bees do the same thing. They'll replace a queen that's not very productive. Um, so they might do it before you even get to it. But this is how you keep track of, of how old they are. And it also, just having a mark on them um, lets you know that that was your original queen. So if you came back at some point during the season and you you see your queen, but she's not marked, um, there's a small chance that the paint came off. But more than likely... Um, 
your colony swarmed or, or superseded their their queen because they no longer have the mark there. Um, so there's that screen I told you about, but there's also this other device where you can sort of catch the queen and put her in this little tube and use this little foam plunger to get her close to the the screen. And then you can, it's a similar setup with the screen where you mark through the screen. Um, I just prefer the the clip on or the the stick in one because it uh, you don't have to pick up the queen or or do anything. You don't have to mess with her. So, but you might prefer that. Some people just learn to pick up the queen really gently and just hold hold her in your hand and marker. So there's a lot of ways and a lot of different contraptions. Um, here's the little video. Let's see if I can play this. It's a little video on how how I marked the queen. It's uh you start out by obviously get, getting into the hive. And then you have to find her. So I'm just going through each of the frames here. And then yeah, as I say there, I found some eggs. So I know that she's been around within the last three days. And then I found her. There she is right there. The big elongated one. And then I usually wait for her to get to a spot where I'm not going to have to stick that cage into like some developing brood and like kill any any brood or, or mess anything up. And then once I get her in a place like that, I just put that cage right around her. Don't push too hard because you don't want to squish her. So you have to be kind of gentle and slow with it. And then you get your paint marker out. And you mark right through the screen. And then you just remove the screen and back into the hive. It goes. And then after that, I almost certainly just, uh, I stopped my um, assessment I, or my inspection. I just closed it back up. I didn't want to bother her anymore because that was a new a new queen. I didn't want to draw any more attention to her than I had to. Uh, so we'll get into swarming here. So there's a few different triggers for um, what causes bees to swarm. But one of the main ones is they're running out of space. The, there's um, too much congestion in the hive. And as we talked about in the, the pheromone section, when that queen mandibular pheromone gets really dilute and it's kind of spread out amongst too many too many bees, um, so the concentration of that pheromone is low, they start realizing like, hey, we're getting too congested. It's time to, to split, to swarm. And this is actually their way of reproducing. So um, this is how they you know keep creating new colonies. And, and um, so it's actually good for the bees. The reason beekeepers want to control it is because every time they swarm, you're losing worker bees. You're losing like half of your workforce that's uh, going to make honey. And so, um, so that's why beekeepers try to prevent it. So when a hive swarms, so when a colony swarms, they take about, estimates vary, but it's more or less half the bees and um, and they take the original queen. And when they do that, before they do that, they start raising up a bunch of new queens. So you'll have a ton of queen cells uh, being developed in your, your parent colony. And uh, they're working on raising up a bunch of new queens just to make sure that at least one of them survives. And then uh, once those are well underway and looking good, then the, um, the other half of the colony will take off. And uh, before they do that, the queen is actually... Uh, too big to fly so you might see a little bit before before a swarm you might see a your queen getting kind of chased around the hive they uh, the other worker bees they they sort of like force her to keep moving and she actually loses a lot of weight and she gets a lot smaller so if you see your your worker bees kind of pushing her around and you notice that um, she looks smaller they're probably, or they could be preparing to to swarm because if um, 
if she's going to fly, if the queen's going to fly, she has to lose a lot of weight. And um, so that's why they do that. Um, also, before they swarm, they will gorge themselves on honey. All the worker bees will gorge themselves on honey um, because they don't know how long it's going to take for them to find a new home. They haven't found, they don't know where they're going to live when they leave. They find that out after the fact. Um, so they gorge themselves on honey and they also use that, they use that uh, nectar to, to create beeswax in their new hive so that they're kind of ready to, to start building new comb. And they say it takes, uh, I think it's eight pounds of honey, nectar, eight pounds of, of honey to make one pound of wax. So it's a, a very um, resource heavy activity to have to build comb. So they, they really gorge themselves before they leave. And of course, without comb, the queen can't lay eggs. They can't store any nectar. So that's why it's so important that they're immediately able to, to start building. I think this is the same slide with a different picture. I don't know why. Wait, why does it say? That's bizarre. Huh. I don't know why these slides are like this. Um, but the pictures here, this is uh, before, this is actually pictures of uh, supersedure cells. And I think I showed you these on the last one. But they're very similar. They're just, uh, but swarm cells are usually along the edges, along the sides or the bottom, whereas supersedure cells, when they're just replacing a, a queen that's not functional, um, those are usually in the middle of the frame. Um, so this picture right here shows a a hole in the side of um, of the queen cell, and. That is a sign that that queen did not make it. So usually what happened here is you'll have a bunch of queen cells and the first queen that emerges will be the new queen. Um, and she will go around to all the other queen cells and she will tear open each queen cell. Um, she'll sting through them on the side. And so you'll have these little tears on the sides of queen cells um, and those are the ones that, that didn't make it. They were killed before they could emerge. And then if you have like this picture where the queen cell has the opening at the at the end, at the bottom, it's just a normal looking opening. That was the queen who, who made it out and she's going to be the new queen. If two queens emerge at the exact same time, they will literally fight to the death. So it's whoever, whoever wins is the new queen. I'm not sure why all these slides say the same thing. That's an oversight on my part. Why do these all say the same thing? Bizarre. I'm sorry. Um, so this is what swarming looks like. Um, on these pictures here, it's like a massive amount of energy. Um, the bees just come storming out. And if you look up at the sky, it looks like an apocalypse. It looks like some kind of... Um, a plague or something it's there's just bees everywhere and so if you see that you know that you have a, a swarm happening um once they do come out they will fly around for a little bit but they usually land fairly close by um you've probably seen pictures of this and there's one on the next slide um they'll usually group up on a, a tree branch or a sign or sometimes it's on someone's car sometimes it's on a sidewalk um it really depends. Sometimes it's on a building, but they will cluster up like this. And when this, uh, when you're at this point, when they first land and when they're first swarming, this is actually when bees are their most docile. They're, they have nothing to defend. They don't have any brood. They don't have any resources. They are completely full on honey because they just gorge themselves. And so they are not inclined to sting. So that's why you'll see a lot of um, 
uh, beekeepers when they're collecting swarms, a lot of times they don't wear as much uh, protective gear as you might as you might think they would. Hey, buddy. Um, but the problem is, is that if they have to sit there for um, a few days or so, then um, they become increasingly agitated over time. So the first day, the first day they are very docile. But if you don't know how long a swarm has been there, and and they've been there for um, you know two or three days, they might not be as as calm. So unless you know they just landed, you might want to um, you know wear full protective gear if you're going to collect one of these. Um, and as I mentioned on the bottom here, if sometimes they just if they have no luck finding a new home, what they do is they send out they send out scout bees to go find a new home to find a a cavity in a tree or sometimes it's in someone's house or maybe they'll find another beehive that's not occupied. Um, if they don't find something that they like, sometimes they will actually return to the hive that they came from. And if they do that, you kind of lucked out because um, now you have a chance to, they, they will swarm again if you don't do anything, but um, you kind of have a chance to regroup and, and split them into and do an artificial swarm, split them into another box and give them more space so that they're not inclined to, to swarm. Um, so you can catch swarms. A lot of people do this. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and it usually depends on where the bees are located. Um, if a bee is really high up in a tree on, on a branch, you, you'll probably need, you know, some kind of equipment to reach them. Some people use these long poles. So there's a lot of DIY ideas out there. Um, I've seen people use uh, like long paint brushes that they, um, you know, the really long reaching ones for for uh, really high walls. They'll take those and attach a uh, some kind of a bucket, like a five gallon bucket or some kind of a net or not a net, but like a mesh bag to it and they'll use that to catch the bees in um if you have if you're really lucky you might get one that's just eye level on a little branch you know i see those sometimes and literally all you have to do is um either shake the branch with a sharp shake into a into a bucket or into a a, a box of some sort and um and then put the lid on it has to have ventilation obviously um, sometimes you have to cut the branch if you're not able to give it a good shake. Um, but the first thing you should try to do, if you if you can see it right in front of you, is you should look for the queen. Because if you can find the queen crawling around um, and you can take her out, it just makes it a lot easier because they're all inclined to follow the queen. Um, but a lot of times you can't see her. And so you just kind of shake it into whatever uh, box you are using. And... Uh, you can kind of tell if you have the queen because the bees will start following. They'll start the rest of the stragglers will start marching in, and you'll see the Nasanov glands that we talked about in the previous uh, section. Uh, you'll see the the bees fanning the bees, the uh, straggler bees to come into the hive. Um, if I was going to do this, I would probably use a a nucleus box that has um, the entrance sealed off with a mesh netting so it has ventilation but it's not um the bees can't come and go from the hive and then um once i got all the bees in i would uh you know put a lid on it and just make sure it's really maybe put a net around it if you're going to transport it to make sure that bees can't fly around in your car or anything like that um let me see yeah if you have if you have frames of comb that you could put in the box um they really are drawn to the smell of, of beeswax. Um, let's see. Yep, I think I covered all that. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, oh, yeah, there is another thing here at the bottom. Uh, where if uh, sometimes you have bees that you're like, how am I even going to get these out? Because they're they're not on a branch that you can just shake or you can clip. They're just kind of spread out, um, maybe in a lot of different nooks and crannies, and you, there's no good way to get to them. They actually 
I don't know this is like a we're starting to ramp up the cost of, of beekeeping here. But at some point, if you were really interested in getting swarms, there are devices like the Colorado Bee Vac. There's also people who make similar things themselves. But um, the Colorado Bee Vac is basically a, a, a vacuum that is made for bees. So it's made to gently um, suck up bees without killing them. And it's the hose for the vacuum is actually attached to a hive body. So you basically are sucking them into a hive. So they're already um, sort of in a, in a good place once you, once you get them sucked up. And uh, you see a lot of this when you see videos of people doing cutouts in people's houses where bees have established a huge um, colony inside the wall of someone's house. A lot of times beekeepers will take a vacuum, this Colorado bee vac, and they'll just suck up all the bees and then they'll kind of cut the combs out and save them and try to repair them when they get to a, when they can put them into a beehive. Um, so that's another right way you might catch a swarm is by um, using the Colorado bee vac. And by the way, a swarm, a cutout from a house, that's not a swarm, that's a, an established colony. They They consider that house their home, but I'm just using it as another example of why you might use that device. Another thing you could do is catch swarms. So you can buy a swarm trap. There's, um, I think they even have these on Amazon. I'm sure they have them on Better Bee and all the different um, beekeeping websites. Um, but you can also just use if, um, a box. You can just make a box. It doesn't have to be fantastic because uh, as soon as you catch the swarm, you're gonna move it to a regular regular hive um if you want to make the perfect swarm box uh tom seeley who's an author of many beekeeping books and uh a, an expert on bees he this is his field of study um he has a bunch of books on exactly what bees are looking for in, in a home and uh he can help you make the perfect size vessel and and tell you all the tips and tricks but basically if um if you have a box like this and if you can if you can bait it with some beeswax or some uh, lemongrass oil which they really are attracted to you can usually draw in swarms um and and you can catch them in this box and then you can um you can dump this box out into your into another hive or maybe you could even have if some boxes have frames some uh people set up their swarm traps so that they have frames so they can actually sort of let the bees get established a little bit in this box and then move their frames uh, to a new hive, almost like you would when you're, um, when you're putting a nucleus colony into a regular beehive. Um, and this is my preferred method. Uh, I prefer not to have to catch swarms and so what I do is swarm prevention. Um, so as I said, one of the most uh, common reasons that bees swarm is that they are running out of space. And this is very common from, at least here, March through July. The bees are really building up and they want to split into two colonies. So I follow the the seven ten rule. Uh, if bees are occupying seven out of the ten frames in my brood box, then I will add on another box. In my case, I do the single brood chamber method, so I would go straight to uh, a honey super. I would put a queen excluder on to keep the queen out of the honey, so she doesn't lay eggs in the honey, and then I would add on a honey super to give the bees more space to move up. Uh, if you're doing the the standard double brood chamber method, then you would just add a second brood chamber and they would all move up into that. If you see queen cups, like in this top photo here, that is not a queen cell. That is, you will see those all the time and they don't really mean anything. They build them just in case. They are there in case they need to raise a new queen. But as long as they don't have an egg inside them, they're just a queen cup and they're totally normal. You don't have to get rid of them. Um, you can just leave them there. The bees are just sort of, uh, it's their insurance policy. If something happens to their queen, um, 
if their queen's starting to decline or something, they have uh, a little cell that's already kind of started there. It's a queen cup. The queen cells on the bottom there, you can see there's, I think, three of them. That one on the very bottom is particularly uh, good. And so those are just, those started out probably as, as queen cups and then have been expanded into a full queen cell, which kind of looks like a little peanut hanging off the outside of the comb. So you don't want to see, it's okay to see a queen cup. You don't want to see a queen cup with anything in it, with any egg, larvae, uh, anything like that, because that's a sign that your colony is raising a new queen, either to supersede the, the current queen or to swarm. Um, okay, so the seven out of ten rule is the first the first method of preventing swarms. You you know you after you get seven, and when I say um, out of seven out of ten frames are occupied by bees, I mean that they are there's like resources or um, or brood. They're putting something in those frames, and they're those frames are being used. Seven out of the ten frames are being used. Um, my first couple of years, I thought that that meant the seven out of 10 rule. I thought that that meant seven out of 10 frames had like capped brood. And so my bees were swarming like crazy because I was waiting for them to get too far before, before I would add space. So seven out of 10 frames being used to store resources or brood. Um, so that was the first way of preventing splits or for preventing swarms. The second method is making splits. Um, as I mentioned earlier, making a split just means you're splitting one colony into two. And so that gives them more space because you're you're basically swarming for them. You're you're doing what they would have done themselves, but you're you're the one moving the bees to the new home. So they don't have to go out and find a new home. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. I couldn't possibly put them all. I think I put three on here. There's a really good video uh, on the University of Guelph website. And I spell that out on a frame that's coming up if I didn't already put it on this one. Um, if you just look up University of Guelph, that's G-U-E-L-P-H, uh, beekeeping splits, you will get a video on like a bunch of different ways to make splits and you can actually watch him do it. And, and it's Paul Kelly. Uh, he's probably my favorite beekeeper there is. So it's a great, uh, great channel to follow. Uh, so here's one way of making a split. You make sure that you have a, you don't want to do this to a wheat colony because uh, if you don't have enough bees uh, to split, then you're going to have two colonies that are kind of doomed to fail. Um, so once you make sure you have a nice strong colony, you find the queen and I like to leave her inside the, the hive that she's already in just to leave her in the parent hive. Um, so the parent hive and the donor hive, the parent hive is the, the colony you're starting with and the donor hive is the one that you're splitting to make. So you find your queen, you make sure she stays in there and then you move a couple frames of capped brood uh from that colony to your new box that you're trying to start a new colony in and you might use a nucleus box if you have one because it's smaller it gives them a little bit less space to you know it's you're you have a small colony so it's kind of nice to have them in a small box but you don't have to you can put them in a full-size box if that's what you have and then um so you put a couple frames of brood you leave the nurse bees that are on there you you leave them on there um because you wanna make sure that there are enough nurse bees to take care of the brood that's developing. So um, you take a couple frames of capped brood, you put them in the middle of your new box, and then those are surrounded by whatever frames you have. You might only have um, foundation, you might have some comb. If you have some frames of honey, you can put them on the ends. Um, but basically you surround them and you fill out the rest of the 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 box with whatever frames you have but you want the brood to be in the middle because the brood nest is always in the middle of the hive 
Um, and then what you'll do is you're going to take uh, a couple more frames of brood from the parent hive, and you're not going to put the frames into the new hive, but you're going to shake the nurse bees off of those frames into the new hive, and then you're going to return it back, return the brood back to the to where it came from. And the reason for this is because um, you're doing this during the day when there's a lot of foragers out, and all those foragers, they're going to come back to the parent hive, they're not going to, they're not going to know that you made a split. So the parent hive is going to have a lot of bees coming back. There's also going to be bees that drift back that you put into the hive. So just to make sure you have plenty of bees to get your new colony up and running, usually shake a couple more frames of worth of nurse bees into your split that you're making. And then you put the, those frames back. So you have basically two frames of kept brood in your new your new box and then another two frames worth of nurses bees um uh, that you shake into there and then you uh put both your colonies back together you you know put everything your inner cover outer cover and all that back on and then let's see which method did i put first okay so in this method um you're installing a new caged queen. So you, we talked about this in the previous slides. You, you put your new uh, mated caged queen into the hive that doesn't have a queen. And they will usually take to her pretty quickly because um, they don't have a queen anymore. So that's one way of making a split. Another way actually kind of want to skip this one and come back to it because the the third way is actually very very similar to the first way we just talked about the only difference is in this method um you just make sure that there are eggs so that the the queen can raise or so that the colony can raise up a new queen so this is what we talked about earlier where you can save your 40 dollars for your for your caged mated queen so you do everything exactly the same except you Instead of install, installing a new caged mated queen, you just uh, make sure that the frames have eggs so that they can raise up their own new queen. Um, let's see here. And then the third way of doing it, this is if you already have swarm cells. If you come out to your hive and you're doing your inspection and you see that they're preparing to swarm, so your queen is still there, but um, there's a lot of swarm cells. Um, what you want to do is you want to locate your queen, and you want to keep your queen in the parent hive. And then you want to move a couple of the frames of brood that have swarm cells on them. You want to move those to a new hive. And so you're basically doing the same setup, except your these ones have um swarm cells already built onto them but the key thing to remember is that the hive that your original queen is staying in you want to make sure that there are no queen cells in there so you might move a couple frames of brood that have queen cells to your new swarm cells to your new hive box but then you need to remove and destroy any other queen cells that are built in the parent hive because there's a chance that your bees will still swarm if a, if a new queen emerges inside that box with the queen that's already there. Uh, they might go ahead and continue the plan to swarm. So basically, you want your your queen and no queen cells in one box, and then in your new box, you want to have your frames with the with the queen cells on it, and um, and then all the nurse bees that are on the the brood frames too. Um, it's the one we already talked about, by the way, on the, the second one that I talked about where you, um, just let the bees raise their own queen. I prefer to keep the queen in the parent hive that she's, that she was already in, but if you can't find her in this method, it doesn't really matter because she can only be one place. So if, if they're going to raise their own queen, as long as there are eggs in both boxes, Whichever box has the queen, they're not going to try to raise a new queen because they already have one. And the other box will try to raise a queen because they don't have one. So that's called a walk away split because you can kind of just split it. And it doesn't really matter as long as both colonies have eggs. One of them will be queenless and one will be queen right. 
Um, so it's hard to mess that one up. Um, now to get into robbing. So robbing is when bees from one colony steal honey from another colony. And um, this here, this picture here is one of my hives that had a robbing episode. And if you look at the entrance to the hive, you can see all these wax particles. Those are actually the wax cappings. The, the robber bees went into this hive and they ripped the wax cappings off of the, the honey that this colony had stored away. They ripped off the wax cappings and they stole the honey out of all the cells. And so all these wax cappings that were covering the honey just sort of cover the whole bottom of the hive and spill out of the entrance because there's so many of them. So if you see that, a bunch of wax particles, that's a definite sign of robbing. You'll also see a bunch of um, activity, just bees that are just swaying back and forth in front of the hive. They seem very aggressive. They're kind of, they, they kind of just go like this. They sway back and forth and like they're waiting for their chance to get in. You'll see fighting on the entrance between the guards and the and the intruders. You'll see them like, you know, getting ripped apart and they'll, they'll be fighting each other. And sometimes two bees, two guard bees will grab one of the intruders and drag it off the off the um, entrance. And um, so you'll see a lot of that. You'll also see a lot of dead bees that are laying out on the on the landing board and maybe out in front of the hive, too, because they're fighting to the death. Um, another thing that might make you think robbing is if you're in a, in a dearth for us, it's in August when, uh, all the nectar kind of dries up. So I'm very sensitive in August when I see a lot of activity at the front, my mind goes straight to robbing. Um, and sometimes it's not, sometimes I have to take a closer look, but if I see like increased activity during a dearth, I automatically think robbing. Um, another thing you might notice is that alarm pheromone we talked about last time, that smell of bananas in the air. Um, a lot of times it'll smell like that because the, the guards are trying to sting the intruders. And so that pheromone just fills the air. Um, and then you might also see bees that are exploiting. You might have like a little crack or a little hole in your hive, maybe that you didn't even know was there before, but all of a sudden you see a bunch of bees like exploiting that and trying to get into that, that hole. That's another sign of, of robbing. So that's what to look for. Um, I think before I do prevention, I'll do intervention because um, now we know what to look for. Um, we could talk about how you would stop it if you saw it. So, what I do, the very first thing I do if I see robbing ha happening um, is I will take my entrance reducer, which is this thing here, and I will put this on to the smallest opening, which is right there. It's three quarters of an inch. And I will block off the entire entrance of that hive with this so that the only opening is that three quarters of an inch. And that makes your guard bees job a lot easier because now instead of having that whole wide entrance or uh, or maybe you had it set at this you know the three inch or four, four inch setting um reducing it down to this three quarter inch just makes it so much easier because that's all they have to guard now um so that's the very first thing i would do um another thing i would do is i would get out my smoker and i would smoke very heavily at the entrance, it just kind of throws off all their communication and um, and then it just uh, kind of calms everything down. It also makes them kind of uncomfortable when you smoke that heavily. It makes them kind of uncomfortable in that situation. They're kind of like, oh, like, what do I do? Uh, which another thing I do is I will get my, if you can, uh, I have a garden hose that has like a mist setting and I will spray a gentle mist um just right at the entrance not on the entrance but just like right in front of it so where all those bees are swaying back and forth so now they're covered and they're getting misted their um their communications all off with the smoke and they're just incredibly uncomfortable and they usually they won't stay there for very long um it's probably takes like three or four minutes for me to just 
clear the air in front of the hive um, using those two things. Um, and if I have a, I, I have a hive net, which you can see in this photo here, a lot of times I will, after I get them a little bit cleared away, I will throw this net over it. And this keeps any bees from being able to get in or out, which is not great for the bees that live there because they can't get back into their own hive and they, they can't get out. But it just sort of helps stop the, um, in addition to the smoke and the water, it helps stop the influx of intruders that are coming up because they physically just can't get to the hive. So all those bees you see in that picture that are kind of balled up, those bees probably actually live there. Um, they don't they don't have anywhere else to go. They can't get in. So they're just kind of like, we're going to accumulate here on the, as best we can on the hive entrance. Um, so smoke, water, a net. You don't have to have a net. Um, a, a wet towel or a wet blanket works pretty well if you can soak a towel and, and throw it over the top. Um, that also helps block it off. Um, so that's everything I do in the in the immediate sense. And then once everything calms down, I will I will take the net off and and it usually takes maybe 30, 45 minutes before everything's calmed down. And then I will take the net off and I will leave that entrance reducer in with the three fourth inch setting. And usually at that point, you've you've kind of killed the attack and um and now they've had a chance to regroup and they have the three fourth inch opening, which makes it much harder for the robber bees to get started again. Um, so I will leave that in place. And then what I'll do is I'll come back because a lot of times they'll, the robber bees will try again the next day. So I will come back that evening after all the bees are back inside their homes and I will put on a robber screen, which you can see in the picture. And I also have one right here. Um, there's a bunch of different styles. I think they all probably work pretty well. Um, so I will put this on in the evening after all the bees are back in for the night. And what I will do is, um, this particular one has little push pins that you can attach it to the, to the, um, box. It also has these little ears that are perforated. So if you have an eight frame, eight frame equipment, you can actually snap these off and make it less wide so it fits your eight frame equipment. Um, so I'll put this on in the evening. And what happens is I open these little top doors. I might only open one if I'm still really worried, um, but usually I open two, I open both of these. And what happens is when the bees uh, go to leave in the morning, the bees that live there, um, the, the ones that you're worried about getting robbed again, when they go to leave, they'll be trapped because they can't get out because the screen's in the way. But eventually they figure out that, hey, there's a couple holes here at the top, these little secret exits that we can leave out of. And so they'll fly out and they'll do a little orientation flight and they'll see, oh, okay, so I just have a new way of getting in. And they figure out how to use this. They figure out how to get in and out of their hive using these secret passageways. And the robber bees, they don't... They can never figure it out. They, they never figure out to go in here. They come up and they'll keep trying to, if they come back, they'll try to get in and they follow the smell of honey, which is coming from the entrance, which is down here. And they're bouncing off this, trying to get in and they just can't figure it out. And they usually give up pretty quickly. And meanwhile, the bees that, that live in that hive, they just go right up through there and they have no problem getting in and out. Um, and so that sort of solves solves the issue. Um, so that's, that's more of the, uh, for the next few days to make sure that it doesn't, they don't strike again. So those are the me methods I use to intervene in robbing, um, uh, prevention, uh, what's the saying? It's, yeah, it's better to prevent than it is to try to recover. Um, but for prevention, I use, I, I use a bunch of different techniques. I first of all, I avoid doing inspections doing it during a dearth because um, there's no nectar out, and so bees are looking for um, some source of food to exploit. And so, if you open a beehive and they smell all that honey, that 
that hive is just sort of uh, a sitting duck to be robbed as soon as you open it. Um, so I, I avoid it if I can. If I can't avoid it, then I use those cloth inner covers that I showed you last time, where it's just a piece of cloth that, and it doesn't have to be specifically made for this. You could use a towel. You just lay it over the frames that you're not inspecting so that as much of the, as many of the frames as possible are covered while you're not working with them. Um, so they're not exposed to robbers coming in. Um, so if I have to inspect for some reason, I will use one of those. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. So how do you know if you're in a, if you're in a dearth? Um, you will see slowed production of beeswax because they use the nectar to make beeswax. Uh, you'll see slowed storage of honey. You might be like, oh, all of a sudden my honey supply is, you know, dropping. It was building up, building up, building up, and now it's stopped. That's because there's no, there's no nectar. There's no flowers available. Uh, they're all dried up. And so the bees are um, having a hard time making any, any honey. Um, you might see fewer foragers going in and out of the hive because there's nothing to forage for. And also, you might notice this. I don't do this ever on purpose, but um, sometimes, like if if you are, if you have honey outside, um, like say you're, I don't know. For me, it was when I was um, having a bagel with with honey on it. You'll notice like an increased interest. You know, usually they would just ignore you, but um, if they're in a dearth and and they smell honey, um, they're highly attracted to it. So if you have honey or even like a uh, some kind of a sugary substance. If you spill it, they might be interested in it. Uh, so those are some signs that you might be in a dearth. Also, you can talk to your local beekeepers and ask them, you know, what, because it's a lot of times it's the same every year for us. It's August. It might be a different month where you're at. Um, but you can ask like, what's a really bad time to inspect the hive? And they can usually tell you. Um, another thing is avoid entrance feeders. Uh, I don't think I even mentioned these, but there are feeders you'll see advertised where it's like a jar that's like upside down. And, and it's actually the same ones that I use inside the hive, but this one sits on like the landing board and um, it's like where the bees fly in and out because it's so exposed and it's outside the hive um, that invites robbing because um, the robbing bees can smell the sugar syrup. So I would avoid entrance feeders. Um, I already mentioned the cloth inner cover and yeah, I think that's all I do to prevent robbing. We talked about intervention. All right. Here's the, I think the main thing everyone, uh, needs, which is Varroa information. Um, Tyler, sorry okay. to interrupt. Would now be a good time to do a question, question. check? Does anyone have any questions? You yeah, can, a lot of uh, questions. <clears throat> yeah, that's been a lot of information. So you can take yourself off mute and ask your question, or you can put it in the chat. All right, I don't see anything, but if you have a question as we go along, feel free to plug it into the chat and we'll address it once Tyler has a stopping point. Okay, so one of the main issues, I'm sure you've heard of it if you've looked into beekeeping at all, is uh, Varroa mites. They are probably the number one killer of honeybees. And so uh, there's a lot of information out there and it's a lot of, um, um, you know, everyone's trying to to keep Varroa mites at bay so that their, their colonies don't die because they do wipe out colonies pretty quickly. Um, partially because they reproduce exponentially. So if, it's, uh, if you don't keep them in check, um, they can decimate a hive pretty quickly. There's a picture there at the bottom. That's the Wikipedia picture of a Varroa mite. Um, they are totally visible to the eye. Um, there's none in the, in the top picture there. But um, that top picture is of one of the main viruses that mites carry, which is called deformed wing virus. And you can see that drone has wings that are all twisted up and shriveled. 
And um, that is from a mite vectored virus, the deformed wing virus. So, so it's not just the mites um, that we're worried about, but also the viruses that they carry. Um, they're kind of a, a reddish brown in color. You can see them with your uh, naked eye. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, they, they reproduce inside brood comb under the caps of um, cells. And so they're pretty well protected in there. And what they do is they, they will feed on, on both the developing bees as well as the, the food that the bee larvae are supposed to be using to develop properly. So they'll feed on like the fat bodies of the of the bee itself, and then also on the food that they were supposed to that the bee was supposed to be eating. Um, Varroa mites prefer to reproduce in drone cells, which are the the male bee cells. And the reason being two reasons: one is that it's bigger, so there's just more space to do so, and then also because drones uh, take an extra three days to emerge, so that gives them three more days to make baby mites. So instead of 21 days, drones take 24 days to emerge. And so it just gives them an increased um, period to reproduce inside the cells. Um, let's see, we talked about that already. Um, so here's kind of the, the life cycle. So basically a, a female varroa mite goes inside of an uncapped cell of a honeybee larvae um, and it waits eating the while eating the larval food. And then uh, once that, as soon as that cell gets capped, and usually they go in there right before it's about to get capped. They don't, they don't go in there too early. Um, they kind of know when it's about to be capped. And so they go inside, the cell gets capped, and then um, the mite begins to feed on the larva itself. And then within three days, the, the female varroa mite lays her first egg, which will be a, a male varroa mite, which is... Um, it's much smaller than the females, but it's the first one that comes out as a male. And then after that, she'll start laying eggs in 30 hour intervals. And those ones are females. And when those eggs hatch, the female mites mate with their brother, who was the first one to, um, to come out. And, um, and then when, and then once the bee finally emerges, um, fertile, the fertilized female mites come out and they hop on another nurse bee who's hanging around all the, the open brood and they wait for their opportunity to um, to go into a cell and basically start the whole process over. And um, usually the male mites, I was reading, I'm not sure why, but they, they actually remain inside the cell. They don't leave. Um, so here's a picture sort of of what I was talking about. So you have the adult bee with the with the mite and then the mite crawls into a uncapped cell with larvae feeds on the food then after it's capped feeds on the the pre pupa um lays the first egg which is the male 60 hours after capping um and then the subsequent ones are female and then you can see the in that picture number six um the eggs developing into larvae and then they mate within the cell and then when the adult leaves she has the the mites on her and then that last photo number 10 you can see that the mites transfer from bee to bee and they like to stay on nurse bees because the the nurse bees are the ones that are hanging out by all the the open cells so um and you, you'll see this when you're reading about them um the the bees they're the mites that are on bees those are called phoretic mites so if you see the term phoretic mite that just means that the those are the mites that are not in cells developing. They're the ones that are actually being carried around um, on bees. And when we talk about mite treatments, this becomes important because a lot of the mite treatments don't penetrate the brood cappings. So you're really only getting the mites, the phoretic mites. That's the only ones that's killing. So um, we'll talk about that when we get to the treatments here. Um, so it's advised that when you're before treating for varroa mites, uh, that you monitor for them. And I think they just don't want, um, they don't want people to over treat because it decreases the efficacy of the different products. So they want you to make sure you're, 
might counts meet a certain threshold before you employ a treatment. Um, so we'll talk about different ways of, of testing. Um, one way of testing, and we'll go into each method step by step, but um, is an alcohol wash. This is the one I have. It's called a Varroa Easy Check. Um, you can find these on Amazon. There's another one that I've never used, um, but Cayman Reynolds from Tennessee's Bees. He has a YouTube channel. I think he uses one called uh, Saracel, and he has a video on that one. So you might check into that one too to see which one works best. There's also DIY plans for making your own if you're handy. Um, so basically the the gist of this is that you, uh, you're going to put 300 bees into an alcohol wash and um, they get exposed to rubbing alcohol, which kills them, but it also kills the mites that are on them. And, and um, you shake it and then you'll see uh, it has a little like a strainer inside and the mites fall through the strainer, but the bees don't. So you can see how many mites fall off and then you can get a, um, a count of how many mites you have. And you use a half a cup of bees when you're doing this because a half a cup is roughly 300 bees. And so however many mites you have, you have you can divide it by three um, and you can get your percentage of how many, like what your infestation rate is. So if you add um, three mites, then you have a 1% infestation rate. And that's the rate that they use to, um, they use to determine if you need to treat or not. Um, so that's one method. Uh, another method is the sugar roll. A lot of people prefer this. Um, I've used it quite a lot. It's basically you get some number eight wire, one eighth inch wire, and you put it on a mason jar. Uh, you put your bees inside and then you scoop in two tablespoons of powdered sugar through the screen and it falls down on the bees and you're doing the shaking again. And, um, and then you shake it out and the, I have some push pins in here right now, but the mites fall through the screen and the bees don't. And um, we'll go into the details, but you get your count doing that. Um, and so that's another way of counting. And that one does not kill the bees. So a lot of people like that one, even though it's probably not quite as accurate. A lot of people consider it accurate enough and uh, they prefer not to have to kill any bees, um, which is you know up to you. Um, so that's another method that you can use. Um, another method, which is the one I used this year, is the the um, sticky paper method, which is where you use a screened bottom board. So this is a screen. This is this is the the bottom board of the hive. So this is what the bee would the, would be the floor of their hive, and it has a screen, and when mites fall off of bees, which happens quite a lot, um, they'll fall through the screen. And if you have a sticky board underneath your screen, um, they'll stick to it and they can't move. And then you can get a count and sort of assess how many how many mites you have. Um, I use this one it's from Miller Bee Company. It's uh, because it has a grid on it, it, makes it a little easier to count, to keep track. Um, and I also like it because it's reusable. So instead of coming sticky, uh, you know, some of them come with like a thing you peel off and it's already sticky. This one, you just use Crisco and you spread it all over it or Vaseline if you want, spread it all over the board. And then when you're done, you can literally just wash it off with a hose and uh, reuse it. We'll go over the details on that one as well. Um, but that's another method of, of counting mites. Uh, so here's the step by step with the with the mites. Um, you need rubbing alcohol. You need a a container, something like a I feel like a litter box, like one of those standard litter boxes is like the perfect container. Um, especially if it's if it's white because it makes it easier to see mites. Um, so basically, what you want to do is you want to locate your queen because you do not want no matter which test you do, uh, sugar roll or alcohol wash. You want to make sure you don't subject your queen to it because um, that's uh, not going to help anyone. So you want to make sure you find your queen and you can put her in a, a queen clip like this one and put her to the side. Or you can just sort of um, 
make sure you know where she is. But like, if you see her, if you pull out a frame of brood and you see your um, queen on the next frame over and you can see her crawling around, well, you know, she's not on this frame because she's on that frame. So that's what I tend to do. Um, but if you want to make sure you can always um, put her in a little queen clip that will keep her separated. Um, or you can take the frame that she's on and put it, some people keep a little nucleus box and they just will put it down into that box, the frame that she's on down into that box to kind of keep it to the side until they're done getting their bees for the treatment. Um, so once you know you don't have your queen, then you um, fill your, if you use this container, you fill it with rubbing alcohol until it reaches the bottom of the strainer. And then you take out a couple of frames of brood that don't have the queen, uh, preferably in various stages of development. And you will shake the bees off of those frames and into your plastic tub, like your litter box or whatever. You'll shake it into there. Um, and all these nurse bees will fall off. And the reason you want brood frames and is because... Um, those are the ones with the nurse bees who get the phoretic mites on them. So those are the ones you want to be testing. So you'll shake. You don't want to be too rough because you don't want to rough up the, the brood, but just a couple of like firm um, shakes into the, into the bucket um, from a couple different frames. And then after that, you'll take, I'm going to bring my one half cup scoop, but just a regular, like you would use for baking a one half cup um, scoop you scoop up the bees and sometimes it's best if you take the the box that you shook the bees into and you just kind of give it a little um, jerk so that all the bees kind of fall down into one corner. And then you scoop about a half cup of bees and then um, and then you let's see where are we at here. And then you yeah, then you put them down into the alcohol and then you put the lid back on and then when you shake it it will cover the bees in alcohol and then that will um kill them immediately which again people don't like to do but one thing i will say in favor of that is that um bees all the time are killing themselves for no reason other than to protect their hive so they will sting something that is almost certainly not uh, an invader almost certainly not going to do anything to their colony they'll go out and sting which kills them um to protect their their colony so if you need something that makes you feel better about killing bees you could think that any any bee would give its life to if it knew that it was like protecting the colony because that's their whole thing that's that's what they want to do that's their whole goal um so you put the lid back on and um Sorry, I'm a little lost in my from explaining. And then you uh, add alcohol to the fill line and then you you put the lid back on and then you shake it for two minutes and you let the, you sit it in the, um, to the side and let and let the bees kind of, or the mites kind of settle to the bottom through the strainer. And then after that, you count that number, as I said previously, and you divide it by three and that gives you your infestation rate. So if you had nine, um, nine mites would be a 3% infestation rate. Um, and then you can, we'll talk about the guidelines for treatment. Um, and actually put that here on this slide. So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought I heard someone. Um, so treatment guidelines vary. Um, but yeah, usually greater than one to 2% in the spring or greater than two to 3% in the fall. Um, most recommendations will recommend that you treat. Um, I use the Ontario tech transfer. And my only reason for doing that is because I've noticed that most of the people that I watch and listen to, they use the same thing. So I just went with that just to have a guideline, but you might find something that you like better. Um, so let's see what else I put in here. Um, oh yeah, so the these easy checks, they actually have lines uh, on them for determining how many bees you need. So if you, you could actually scoop them straight into the thing instead of using a measuring cup. 
but I prefer the measuring cup because um, the bees, when you scoop bees up with the device itself, they're all trying to get out. So it's really hard to like, to try to measure while also trying to keep them inside. So it's, it's better if you just grab the half a cup of bees, put it in, put the lid on, and then you know you have a half a cup. Um, but just to let you know, that's also an option. And we talked about the Saracel. Um, as for the sugar roll, this number eight wire, you can get it at the hardware store. Um, if you don't want to have to cut the circle out to the perfect size of a wide mouth jar, they sell them on Better B, I think for a couple dollars, um, where you get like the lid and the, and the screen where it's already ready to go. It doesn't come with the jar, but the lid and the screen. Um, so you'll need that jar. Um, we kind of already talked about, about a lot of this. Um, yeah, so you want to, same with the alcohol wash, you want to um, find your queen, make sure you're not subjecting her to this test. Um, get your half a, half a cup of bees, put it inside, put the lid on, pour the powdered sugar, two tablespoons through the lid. Um, and then you want to um, shake the bees around for um, for two minutes. You want to kind of vigorously shake them. And then uh, I try to do like circular motions because I don't want to like the, send the bees slamming against the sides of the jar. Um, but yeah, about two minutes of um, of shaking. And then I put them off into the shade because there's, you know, you want them to live. So you don't want them like sitting with the sun beating down on them. And then um, after you roll the jar for two minutes um, and set it in the shade, um, you can line the bottom of your plastic tub, the one that you used to get the, to put the bees in, to shake the bees in. You put all those bees back and now it's empty. Um, you can line that with white paper towels. And basically what you're gonna do is um, once the two minute period is up of, of waiting, then you um, will shake all the sugar out of the jar firmly, but gently, because again, you don't want the bees slamming up against the, um, the jar. And you shake it all out, and basically what will come out is the powdered sugar and the mites, because the mites fit through the screen, the sugar fits through the screen, but the bees will stay in the jar. And then you take a, a bottle of water and you just spritz spritz the powdered sugar, and the powdered sugar will melt in the water and soak into the paper towel, and that will reveal all of your varroa mites. And you can see one in the picture right there. Um, and so then you count your varroa mites and then you're back to your um you're back to using your references for when to treat um and then you all those bees that you have in the jar that are covered in powdered sugar you can just dump them right back on top of the frames and they'll crawl in and uh they'll slowly clean themselves up the next time you uh do an inspection sometimes you'll see bees that still have a little bit of the powdered sugar you can say i'm sorry sorry about that last week um But that's how you do the sugar roll. And again, this is the same as in the, the previous ones. You divide by the number by three to get your um, infestation rate. Um, Better B has um, a recommendation that you treat for a 2% infestation rate using this, um, using this method. And they get their information from the same one I do, which is the Ontario Tech Transfer. You can look that up, Ontario Tech Transfer, T-E-C-H. Um, and you can find all the different guidelines for every different method. They have one for the for the sticky sheet. They have one for the alcohol wash. They even have a different one if you didn't have alcohol on you and you wanted to use like windshield washer fluid or something. They have, um, they have information, like guidelines for that as well. Um, I mentioned this, but the reason we use the the brood frames is because that's where the nurse bees hang out, and the nurse bees are the ones with the phoretic phoretic mites. Um, and then, yeah, regardless of the uh, whether you use the alcohol or the uh, sugar roll, a lot of beekeepers will test monthly throughout the season just to see how their levels are doing. Um, and a lot of people just do one test in the in the spring, and then one test in the late summer. And then if they can, 
one test in the midsummer, but the spring and late summer, um, to see how your bees are starting out with mites and then see how, before you go into winter, how they're doing. Those are probably the most, most important ones. Of course, if you use the sticky board, which we're going to talk about next, um, it's really easy to just monitor throughout the season. You don't have to do anything with the bees. That's what I like about this one. Um, and that's why I used it this season because you can sort of monitor your levels without even having to fuss with the bees. Um, so I kind of talked about this already, but it, you know, you coat the, the, the board with Crisco, unless you have one that comes that's uh, sticky already. Um, you put the board in the uh, little slot under the, under the screen, there's a little place for it to slide into. And when the mites fall off, they fall through the screen, they get stuck to the Vaseline or Crisco or the sticky board that you have underneath there. And then you let them sit like that for anywhere from, well, it has to be in increments, either 24, 48, or 72 hours. 72 hours is the desired um, amount of time. And the reason being is it gives you three days worth of data as opposed to one. So you might have the first day you might have like, an, um, you know, maybe no mites drop, even though you have, you know, a fair amount of mites in there or maybe more drop than normally would have. So you just get like a better average over three days. Um, and the reason they don't do more than three days is because after three days, the there's so much debris that falls through and gets onto the onto the board that it starts to get kind of hard to count the mites and to tell them apart from the debris. So three days is kind of the the sweet spot for um, you know getting three days worth of data, but also having a board that's clean enough to to count. So uh, whichever one you do, you want to get a mites per day count. So if you do it for one day, then that's your mites per day count, however many mites fell. If you do it for two days, then you want to um, divide the number in two, and then that's your mites per day count. If you do it for three days, like I do, you divide it by three, and that's your mites per day count. Um, and then you use that number to refer to the guidelines um, as to whether or not you should treat um, so this picture here, this is a, we'll talk about the different treatment options, but this is what my board looked like a few years ago af after, uh, a formic acid treatment. So <laughs> there were just, this is called mite drop, whatever your, whatever number of mites you get, that's called your mite drop. And, uh, there were way too many to count. The formic acid was very, very effective, um, on this particular treatment. So uh, that's that's what a really uh, a big mite drop looks like. Um, so we talked about the treatment, the Ontario Tech transfer. Um, oh, so the point of this picture on here is, I just wanted to say that um, these, these sticky boards are really good at seeing how effective your treatment was. So even if you don't use them for your regular counting, if you could put one under, um, your screen bottom board and um and and right you know right after you treat your for mites you treat your bees for mites you can just see how many mites fell and you, it gives you an idea of how how uh, effective it was um also i should mention while all these are primarily used with screen bottom boards they actually do make a version if you have a solid bottom board that's just wood there's no screen um, they actually do make a version that you can slide on top of a um, solid bottom board that has like a built-in screen. Um, so you could still use these even with even with a solid bottom board. Okay, now the different treatment options. There are so many different treatment options. Uh, I've only used, I think, three. Three different treatment options. Um, but there's way more than that. Um, and I, I have a, a sheet coming up that shows you different ones. But the most important thing, I think, or the two most important things, one is to not just use one thing because you don't want to create resistance. Um, you don't want your the mites on your bees to get used to this one treatment because then they become uh, resistant to it. So you want what they call it IPM, integrated pest management system, um, where you, you use a, a variety of different treatments and or methods 
they don't, they don't necessarily have to be uh, chemicals. Um, but uh, you want to use a variety of things to try to stave off resistance. And then the other thing is um, that you really have to pay attention to is the different parameters of each treatment. So for example, on this, on this slide, you can see that, that Formic Pro has a temperature parameter. You can't use Formic Pro if it's under 50 degrees or over 85. If it's under 50 degrees, it's not effective. If it's over 85, it'll it's really harsh on your bees and it will kill a lot of your bees. Um, so some of these treatments have temperature parameters. Some of them um, can't be used when you're when you have honey supers on, while others can. Um, so there's a lot of different parameters that you might consider. Also, some of these don't, like I said earlier, they don't penetrate the brood cappings. So they're not really doing anything if you have a bunch of capped brood. Um, they're not doing anything to kill those mites under the brood cappings. Um, so you just have to sort of, you know, make a plan and sort of look at all the parameters of each one that you want to implement and decide when they would best be used. So we'll start with Formic Pro. It's probably my favorite treatment. Um, it's a, I like it because it's an or organic compound and it's it's already found it actually naturally occurs in bees. It naturally occurs in honey. It naturally occurs in a ton of fruits and vegetables. Um, in the bees, it's in their it's in their venom. Uh, that's where it's found naturally in bees. So I like that. Of course, um, this is at higher concentrations, so it's um, it's not as low as you would find it in, in a piece of fruit. But it's um, but I like that it's the same compound that you can find throughout nature. Um, it's very, very effective because as you can see in that last photo, this is a, this is the result of Formic Pro. Um, it's very effective because it, it, uh, penetrates the brood cappings. And so it gets all those mites that are underneath the brood cappings and not just the ones, the phoretic mites that are crawling around on the, on the bees themselves. Um, it is you'll see these different ratios, like uh, they have a ratio of how, how harsh a miticide is on mites versus how hard it is on the bees. And it's only, this one is only slightly harsher to the mites than it is to the bees. So the bees really don't like it. It's very intense. And if you get a whiff of it, it's like, it'll knock you over. Um, so it's a very intense um, uh, treatment, but it's also organic, I think, in it's uh, in New Zealand, and I think they're working on it here, making it like a considered an organic treatment. Um, so it's very effective, but it but it will kill some of the weaker bees that um, you know were kind of on their way out anyways. Um, and sometimes it can cause queen loss. I don't know the percentage on that. I think I've only lost one queen um, in my years of using this. Um, so you cannot use this. That's a, another parameter. You can't use this in a hive that's barely surviving. You don't want to use it in a weak hive because it all, um, it's too harsh for them. Um, you have to remove the uh, entrance reducer for ventilation because um, it's so, uh, like, I don't know the word, but they so potent, I guess, is the word that you have to allow for ventilation. But they want the the company that makes it says you should close off your screen bottom board because you don't want that much ventilation, but you do want to leave the, the entrance open. You can't have an entrance reducer, which leads to one of the main problems with this one is that if you're doing this before going into fall and you're in your dearth and your entrance is wide open and you're at risk for robbing, um, what do you do if you have a robbing episode because you can't, um, you can't block off the entrance because you need the ventilation um, so what I have taken to doing is I will block off a lot of the entrance with wire mesh. So that way the air can still get through, but robber bees can't get it in. And, um, if, if I do start noticing like a robbing episode actually happen, I'll even take it all the way down to three quarters of an inch. I'll block it off everything, but three quarters of an inch, um, using that wire mesh, um, but until I see uh, any robbing, I'd probably only block off like half. Sometimes I think I even leave them open if it's a really strong hive. 
Um, another thing about this is that um, it's okay to use it with honey supers on. I still don't because I really like being able to tell people that I sell honey to that I don't have um, my, I never use my treatments with honey supers on. Um, it just makes it so much easier for me to just tell them that. Um, but because there is formic acid naturally in honey, they don't, they don't make you take the honey supers off. Um, it is not okay to feed bees with this, uh, this treatment because especially for the first three days, because then you're increasing the, the risk of, um, of robbing with the sugar syrup and they're already vulnerable and being disrupted. I've also read somewhere that it's like something about the the formic acid when they're when they're eating it burns their mouth parts or something i i'm not sure but um but you're not supposed to feed with this uh especially for the first three days but preferably not at all um and there's two different options you'll see this on the packaging if you buy this um, there's a 14 day treatment option and a 20 day treatment option basically the 14 day is like um uh, this really robust, you just hit them hard and, 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 um, with two of these strips of, uh, formic acid and, uh, it knocks out the, the mites really quickly and you're done in 14 days. The 20 day treatment you use, you use one, um, one of those treatments just instead of two. And so you use like half the strength, but it's twice as long or not twice as long, but a week longer. Um, so that one's a little bit more gentle with the bees, but it takes longer. And I don't, I don't know. I don't have the numbers for this, but I've, I've heard some beekeepers talk about how they, it hasn't been as effective for them to do the one for 20 days, as opposed to the two for 14. Um, but it's up to you. It's still an option and, and the manufacturer still recommends it as an option. So um, I don't think you'd be in the wrong to do that method. If you, if you just want to see how it goes uh, for 20 days with the lighter treatment. So that's uh, that's probably my favorite treatment is the formic acid. And then my second favorite is oxalic acid. And again, I like this because it's found in nature. It's in fruits, vegetables, plants, fungi, and honey. Um, again, it's just a higher dose. It's a higher concentration of the of oxalic acid than you would find in those things. Um, but bees, this is not as far as that ratio goes with how how harsh it is to mites versus um, versus bees. It's way worse for the mites. The, the bees don't really seem to notice it at all. Um, so that's one great thing about oxalic acid. One bad thing about it is that it this is one of the ones that doesn't penetrate brood capping. So you're only getting the phoretic mites. But there are times of the season where you don't have a lot of brood, capped brood. So, you know, I use this mostly in the, the early spring or the, or the fall, you know, getting ready to go into winter just to do like an extra knockdown um, because there's not a lot of capped brood. Most of the mites are already on bees. And so there's a, a good time just to, to use this that's uh, where it's very effective. And I, I want to say it's um, like 90 or 95 percent effective at what it does. It doesn't it's not effective at all on the, the mites under the cappings. But as far as killing the mites that are on the bees, it's very, very effective at that. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. There's vaporizers like this one that I'll show you um, that you can use to uh, it's actually more like sublimation, I guess. But you. Um, put uh, oxalic acid powder in a in this device and it heats it up and it comes out of the spout and goes into the beehive and um, kind of coats everything. So that's one way of doing it. Another way to do it is that you can make a, um, let's see here. you can use um, the dribble method, which is where you, or the drip method, where you basically make a solution of a one-to-one -one sugar syrup which by the way, my wife pointed out, I never clarified what I meant by that. One-to-one um, -one sugar solution, when I talked about that last time, I just meant one part water to one part sugar um, by weight. Um, and if you don't have a scale, I read that it's actually fairly close if you just do it by, by volume as well. Um, so one-to-one -one sugar syrup. So you put 
you make um, a liter of that of one to one sugar syrup and you dissolve 35 grams of oxalic acid into that sugar syrup and make sure, you know, obviously keep that out of reach of children. You don't want, I have a two year old and a six year old who will grab any cup. So you want to make sure it's labeled high up out of reach and, and probably just get rid of the rest when you're, if you have any leftover when you're done. Um, so you'll make the one to one sugar syrup, you'll dissolve the 35 grams of oxalic acid in it. And then you use a syringe, uh, probably best if you use a 50 milliliter syringe, which you can get, I think at CVS or one of the drugstores, And um, you can draw up 50 milliliters because that's the most you can use in a colony is 50 milliliters. And um, you basically go through your hive and you look down in between the frames and you'll have um, what they call seams of bees. So you might have each, each gap between the two frames is considered a seam. And if you look down and you see bees in that seam, then you can apply five milliliters of the 50. You can do five milliliters for each seam with a maximum of, of 50 total for the for the colony. Um, and then you don't apply any if there's no bees in that seam. So you, you might have a couple frames where there's no bees and you don't you don't do anything with that. So but you dribble down five milliliters of the solution. So that's the dribble or the drip method uh of doing it and then um the vaporizer that i showed you that comes you you drill a one fourth inch hole in the back of your hive um this is from la robe bees it's uh made in the u.s it's like a handmade thing um but they send you this and they send you these little cups which they say are good for 400 uses um and basically each cup is good for um, two deep brood boxes. So if you only do one, then you fill it halfway and, um, you put your oxalic acid powder and they recommend, you know, getting one that's actually made for bees. Um, people have their own thoughts on that, but, um, I just get the one from better bee that's, I know is for bees. So it, it's pure oxalic acid. And, um, you put your oxalic acid with the, it comes with a scoop and you put it into your little cup and uh, mine, I fill halfway because um, I only do one deep brood box instead of two. And um, let's see if I can point this down. You uh, put it on top of your hive and then you turn this over and you push down and you have this, um, you have it on there like this so that the oxalic acid is now um, falling down into this little reservoir. And then you give it a few taps to make sure it's all there, um, but you don't actually, you actually keep it upside down until you put the, um, until you put this nozzle into that hole in your hive. And then when you, and then you turn it up because as soon as you turn it over, um, the heat starts making this vapor and it goes into your hive. So you don't want to turn it over until it's inside the hive. And then uh, the machine tells you when it's done, it takes like 45 seconds to a minute and 15 seconds on a cold day. And, um, and then your treatment's complete and you can move on to the next the next hive. It has a little plug-in so you can, I do an extension cord, but um, you might have some other setup for it. Um, so that's another quick way to treat for oxalic acid. Um, whichever method you use, you want to use like gloves, chemical resistant gloves. You want um, protective glasses and also a respirator mask, which I should give you this information because it took me a while to find it. Um, when you get a respirator mask because you don't want to breathe in the oxalic acid, um, it's important to get the right filters. And I actually contacted 3M and fortunately I got in touch with, uh, someone who was not only an expert on filters, but was also a beekeeper. And so she knew, uh, which, which one to recommend. And uh, the one she recommended was um, the 3M, uh, it's number 60923, 60923 for organic vapors. Uh, so this, these are the ones that um, 3M recommended. Of course, uh, I'll have to recommend that you call them yourself and, and verify everything yourself. Um, but when I called, this is what they told me. And it makes sense because it's, 
organic vapor, acid gas, all these things. So, um, so get a, uh, a respirator so you don't breathe that stuff in because it's not good to breathe it in. Um, so you want to make sure you wear all your protective gear, but that's another option for oxalic acid. And one of the great things is that there's no temperature parameter. You can do this when it's cold um, and um, you don't have to worry about that, but you, they, uh, you should not use it with honey supers on. Um, I was actually looking into the latest news on this uh, right before we started because um, it's been a little contentious lately. The FDA has been suggesting that maybe it's okay to have the honey supers on because um, it's naturally found in honey anyways, but that's not, it's not labeled that way yet. So I would say do your own, you know, I don't use any mite treatments. So it's, it makes it easy for me because I don't do any mite treatments with the, with the honey supers on. But if you want to, I would look into that first and see what you think. Um, another treatment option is Apivar. Um, this is another really good one. It's, this is, uh, a more synthetic option. It doesn't have like the the organic um, PR stuff that goes with it, but it's a it's a synthetic medication. It's um, it, it's embedded on a on these two little strips. You order a package of strips, and the strips are probably I don't know six inches long or so. I don't have any on me, but um, it's a six to eight week long treatment, 42 to 56 days. And then you cannot use it with honey supers on because it'll contaminate your honey. Um, and you also can't use it until you wait two weeks after the treatment period, which is already pretty long. It's six to eight weeks. So you're looking at eight to 10 weeks before you can have honey supers on. So that's just one of those parameters you'd want to consider um, before using the treatment. So maybe if you had like a really unseasonably warm, um, late winter, early spring day, you could get out there early enough where you could put those in and then, um, your treatment could be done well in advance of putting on honey supers. Um, but those are just the sort of things you have to calculate for your area. Um, so you want to wear gloves that you don't know, get the medication on your, on your hands. Um, this one doesn't, does not penetrate brood cappings, but because it's, it works on contact and it's there for so long and all of these bees that are coming out with it, it's pretty effective at, um, at, because it's just, it's the length of the treatment that's because it's so long and, um, the, the brood period, you know, they're exposed to it for so long. It, it has a good chance to get so many mites off. And this one is another one that's 90 to 95% effective. So even though it doesn't go through the cappings, it's getting the mites basically as soon as they come out of the, the cappings. So, um, and it's also not temperature dependent. So it's another great thing about this one, but basically I'll show you on the next um, deal here. These little strips, they you put them, you stagger them um, a couple frames apart right in the middle of the brood nest. And uh, it just gets passed on by exposure to the, like the bees get exposed to it from crawling on it. And um, yeah, it's very effective at, at killing mites. And you can see on the instructions, it'll tell you how many do you, how many to use given your scenario. Um, but the bees don't mind it at all. They crawl all over it. They don't, it doesn't uh, aggravate them at all. And uh, I should actually mention with the formic acid, the one that does my favorite one, but it does um, agitate them. It's completely normal with the formic acid to see bees like hanging out outside with like doing the bearding thing where they're trying to get out of the hive. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's normal to see a little, little bit of that, you know, where they're kind of worked up. Uh, but this one, Apivar, doesn't cause any of that. Um, the downside is that um, traces of the medication can remain on the comb, which is fine, except that it causes um, it can cause resistance because it builds up in the comb, so they're always exposed to this low level of it. So you wouldn't want to use this. Like all mite treatments, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to use it by itself because um, it just becomes um less useful they get the mites get more and more used to it 
And I love this sheet. I was thinking the other day, I wish I would have um, attributed it to wherever I got it from. I think it was Cornell University that had this. Um, but this is like the perfect sheet um, for helping you make those decisions because it has so many of the most common common treatments there. You got the um, oxalic acid, the formic, it's got thymol based things, which I, I haven't used, but I've heard good things about. Um, and it shows you all the different temperature ranges, the windows you can use them in, how long they take, whether or not you can use them with honey supers on. Um, and all the, all these, like how much they cost, their efficacy. So um I'll make sure I, I send you guys the video of this and, and if you can, I don't know, do a screenshot of that or something, but um, that's a, that's really good information when you're trying to plan out how you're going to treat for mites. If, if you are going to treat for mites. Um, then we get into treatment free options, which um, I, I use, uh, but I use them in conjunction. I, I use these techniques in conjunction with treatments um because i i like to attack it from all angles um you will find that it's highly discouraged of course your bees are your bees so you can uh try out whatever you whatever you want to try um but it's generally highly discouraged to only use treatment free options because they it doesn't tend to work very well um mites tend to you know they they spread exponentially so they um and then you might have um if you tell your neighbors that you're doing treatment-free options, they might get upset because then those mites get into their apiary. But um, but again, this is all personal. Um, I wouldn't discourage you from doing things the way you want to do them. Um, and a lot of these, like I said, are incredibly effective um, that I use in conjunction with, with treatments. So um, you can choose how you want to how you want to do it. But um, Screen bottom boards just in themselves are great because, um, as I said earlier, the mites fall off the bees, they fall through the screen, they can't get back up. Um, I want to say that that I read somewhere that that, uh, like roughly 10% of mites fall off at some point, so it's not a small number of mites that get um, removed by screen bottom boards. Another thing you could do is um, get a varroa sensitive hygiene um b that has those genetic traits so that they're like just naturally that's in their nature to to uh remove varroa mites from themselves and from from uh, the cells of the brood you know i mentioned this last time they'll actually like if they'll sense that there's mites inside of a cell and they'll tear it open and they'll remove the larvae and the or the the pupa and the mites and they'll remove them from the hive um, so that's another way is just getting mites or getting bees that are, um, really sensitive to, to mites and they want to keep themselves clean and free of mites. That's another good method. Um, another one we talked about earlier is, um, brood breaks. So as I mentioned, if you, if you don't have any brood, um, you don't have any, the mites can't reproduce. So, um, because they reproduce under the capped cells. So if you don't have any brood for them to do that in, um, then they're kind of SOL for for the time being, and that really can drop your uh, your mite load. Um, so you can you can do this by keeping your queen restricted. There's special frames they make that can keep a queen bee restricted to a, a particular frame, and then um, you can actually. Uh, take that frame once she's done with it and you can freeze it. And a lot of people will get, um, I've, I think I showed you those, those drone combs. Some people will literally buy frames that are, you know, the, uh, the foundation that I showed you that had all the worker cells where, so it kind of tricks the, the worker bees into building worker combs. So you have more workers. There's actually one that's for drone comb too. So you can have this foundation that, encourages the bees to make drone combs. So they make these huge cells and then the queen will go through and make this huge frame that's just completely full of, of um, brood comb. 
And of course, the mites are like, this is great because we have the bigger cells, we have the longer development period, we have so many drone cells we can we can um, reproduce in. And so it makes it like the prime environment for them. And so if you can keep the queen on that frame and and have her um, laying all this drone brood and then the and then once it's capped, then you know that the, there's a lot of mites that are reproducing in that frame and you can take that whole frame out shake it off, get all the, the queen and all the worker bees off of it. And you can put it in the freezer and you can kill all those mites that would have been that wasted all their energy trying to reproduce in this, um, in this frame. I've never done that, but I think it's pretty, pretty creative and neat. Um, I also have a, a push in frame that you can use to keep a queen isolated on one frame. Um, I didn't really care for this too much because I found that um, the the worker bees would just chew through the wax of the uh, you know through the foundation through all the comb and they would dig a tunnel to get to her and so by the time I came back to my um, my hive the the queen was already out of this um, I didn't do that for a brood break I did it for another reason but it was uh, not very effective anyway um, Another thing you could do, and when I looked at the studies on this, it seemed like it's not very, not very effective. Um, but maybe it's, you know, I'm sure you'll find some people that think it's effective and you can decide for yourself, but they make um, foundation that's for small cell comb. And the idea of this is that you make it so small that your worker bees will actually be a little bit smaller, but they're okay and the cells are too small for the mites to comfortably reproduce very much in. And so um, if you fill your your colony with or your hive with this kind of comb, they don't have a lot of options as far as where to reproduce. But again, when I saw the studies on this, it didn't seem like it had much of an impact other than creating smaller bees. Um, and then there's just the regular foundation that you use um, is helpful in itself because... Um, even though it's the regular size, um, it's encouraging bees not to make drone brood. And of course, drone brood is where the um, where the mites want to go. So just by having the frame be 90% worker comb instead of 50% worker comb, 50% drone, um, that in itself is a huge advantage to preventing mites. Um, I think I just talked about this, the drone foundation. Um, and how you could freeze the frame. Um, and I don't even think you have to restrict her to that frame. Just uh, she'll draw it out. And you just know by by the nature that it's drone comb that there will be a lot of mites in it because they're going to be drawn to it because of all those big cells. Um, so that's another. And then powder sugar dusting. I've never actually done this, but um, Randy Oliver, who is a world renowned beekeeper, has done it and uh, likes it. So uh, I I... I'm sure it works, or otherwise he wouldn't be doing it. Uh, but Randy Oliver runs uh, Scientific Beekeeping. It's a website, and he's um, often published in the beekeeping magazines, the main ones that we uh, read. And he has found that dusting dusting bees with powdered sugar um, causes the mites to fall off, kind of like when you're doing the, the sugar roll test. It causes the mites to fall off, and then... Um, and then if you have like your screen bottom board that even just doing a little powdered sugar dusting can cause the mite population to plummet. Um, and then let's see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you would just want to, you would want to test after your treatments before and after your treatments to see if, um, or your, your non-treatments, you know, to see if your mites, if you had any impact by, you know, whatever you decide to do, if you're doing the powdered sugar dusting, if you're doing the um, the freezing of the drone brood, um, or whichever method, you just want to make sure you're still monitoring your mites to see if, if you're um, effective. And if nothing else, say you're like not totally adamantly against treatment, but you want to try this um you know, you can employ all these non-medicated things and try your very best to keep the mites below the threshold. And then uh, if you're successful at doing that, you might not even need the 
the treatments at all. So, but yeah, I would just recommend testing to make sure that you do keep the levels low because um, if you don't, your mite little be pretty high going into winter and your bees probably won't make it um, because of the mites and because of the viruses. Um, another common pest is the small hive beetle. This is not nearly as common here as it is in the South. I watch a lot of YouTube channels from the South, um, like Bruce's Bees and uh, Tennessee's Bees, and there's all these different uh, uh, channels in the South where they really seem to have a huge problem with small hive beetles. We do get them here in New England, but not to the degree that they do. Um, they're a little, I should have put a picture on here. I think I have one coming up, but they're a little like four to five millimeter long beetles. You can see them walking around um, and they parasitize the, the colony and they, they um, have, you know, larvae just like um, the other, like the wax moths do that we're going to talk about. And so if this, usually they're not a problem unless your hive is weak and then they sort of capitalize on the weakness of your hive and take over and then you come out and you have all these worms like these larvae crawling all over um and then it becomes an issue um every now and then i'm actually gonna skip straight to the picture every now and then if i see a bunch of them i'll i'll put these i have these beetle blaster devices these are pretty cheap i think i got them off better be um they're not even a a chemical treatment this is just olive oil uh you basically put a little like maybe a i don't know half inch quarter inch of olive oil into the bottom of these things and they fit down snugly in between frames and you put them in between the frames usually um on either end you'll put them in between frames one and two and nine and ten and usually in the corners because um even a moderately strong hive we'll keep these beetles pushed to the outer perimeter of the hive, not, not away from the brood. And so usually the best place to catch them is in the, the corners. Um, so sometimes I'll put a couple of these, I'll put a little olive oil in it and the, uh, the beetles, they just fall right through the little, um, uh, the little gaps in the top and they, they die in the olive oil, but the bees uh, can't fit through the holes. So they don't, they don't get killed. But you do want to fill it in advance and not don't put it in your hive and then and then pour it because olive oil will kill bees if you pour it on them. And so you just have to be really careful with it. Um let's see. Cooking oil, mention that. Um oh, and then in the south, a lot of those channels in the south, I noticed that they use um, you know, those like Swiffer um like I don't know what you call it, like dry mopping pads that are kind of sticky like everything sticks to them um you can take some of those sheets of those and and tear them up and um put them on the top of your hive and uh the bees kind of pick at them and and make them even more sticky and mites get stuck to those and then you can just take them out and throw them away and uh if you follow bruce's bees i think he's in alabama and he will pull out whole sheets of this and it's just completely covered in beetles and like i said i've never had an issue with hive beetles to that degree but if you're somewhere really warm um this might be more of an issue you'll have and then there's wax moth which i uh i think everyone has to deal with including us um so wax moth uh, again are they're attracted to weak or just unprotected comb so wax moth will not survive in a even moderately strong colony. The bees will just keep them at bay. They have no issue doing it. You might even find them if you have a screen bottom board, you might even find them on the underside of the screen, like down in here, trying to survive because the bees have kept them totally out of the out of the hive. Um, and, but if, if they ever get access to unpro unprotected, um, pollen and honey and, and comb they will they'll decimate it pretty quickly and i have some pictures coming up of that um so they start out as an egg and then they hatch into these larvae which you'll see in a second you can see in that picture there a little bit um 
and then they spin a cocoon and they leave this webbing this like almost like a spider web material they just leave it throughout your hive as they decimate it and they start tunneling through the comb and eating all the pollen and it just turns all of your comb into mush that's covered in in webs and and um these little black specks, which is like their poop, they call it frass. So they'll be covered in frass and this white webbing. And um, they basically just destroy everything and it will look like this. Um, so that first picture there, you can see all that webbing. This is a pretty decimated um, comb. I would have just uh, thrown this away. I like to, if you have chickens, the chickens love to eat the, the larvae. So you can peck them off, pick them off and put them in a cup and feed them to the chickens. So then at least you get something out of it. Um, because that comb is, if it gets to that stage and that you see in the first picture, it's pretty well toasted. It'll be all mushy and it's lost all of its integrity. Um, the second picture there is looking down at the hive, like as soon as I opened it. So I actually knew I was like, this hive is failing. And as soon as I get an opportunity, I need to come back and, and uh, take it apart because the bees are not going to survive and it's going to get overrun by wax moth. But I came back too late and I opened up the hive and this is what I saw looking down the wax moth had already completely covered it in all of their silk webbing, their frass, and you can see all the larvae crawling around on top of the frames. And then in the third photo is the, the wax moth itself. That's what it develops into. Um, so that's what they look like. This is what you're trying to prevent. Um, so how I prevent this is that I, uh, whenever I bring a frame into storage, if a, a colony dies or, um, or I'm just removing a box, um, of frames from their, from their hive, I will, I buy these bags called freeze frame bags. I think I mentioned it in the last one. Um, and you don't have to buy these. This is just what I do. Um, and these are on Better Bee, but I'm sure you can get them uh, other places too. And they're just perfectly sized to fit a frame. They're the perfect length and they they seal up with a Ziploc and uh, you can reuse them over and over. Um, so basically what I do is I every time I bring frames in, I um, put them inside these bags and then I put them in the freezer and I let them sit for a few days. And then um, that kills all levels of development of wax moths. So it kills the eggs, the larvae, uh, any moths that are there. Um, everything gets killed. And then I take them out and I actually keep them in the bags to keep any from like, if uh, somehow, you know, obviously I brought in a frame later on and it had an egg on it. It keeps uh, them from getting reinfested because they can't access the, the frame through the bag. Um, another thing you could do is they really hate light. And so you can find videos on this, but if you can stack up the, the boxes of frames that you have, if you don't have a freezer to put them in or the bags to put them in, um, simply just staggering them and making sure that light can reach through all the boxes makes it highly inhospitable for them. I would still check on them. Um, but the worst thing you could do is just stack them all up perfectly and put a lid on top. So everything's dark inside. That's exactly what they want. So if you could stack them up, you know, um, maybe like, a with the corners, I don't know if you know what I mean, but stack them up so that light's getting through all of them. Um, that would really, that would really help too. And somebody mentioned, uh, that having a big freezer where they could just put the whole, the whole hive box in there with the frames in it. That's totally fine too, as long as it's getting frozen um, and killing all those wax moth at all stages of development. You should be you should be good. Um, talked about light. Um, there's chemical options. I've never used these. Um, I just I just try to avoid chemicals where I can. Um, but if you want to, there they have. Um, I think it's called Paramoth. I think that's on Better Be also. Um, but there's a ton of different options for um, things you can put on, put around them to keep the the wax moth out of out of your uh, frames. Um, oh my god, let's see. Um, other diseases to look for. Basically, 
there's a bunch of different pathogenic ones. Uh, I would say it's good to have just have something like this where you can look back and and compare because they're all different. If you have like a sunken uh, larvae or if it's like all dried up and you can sort of look at these manuals and see what maybe is going on inside your hive um, and see what, you know, there's one that has like a toothpick test where you can take a toothpick and if you drag it out and it's it creates like a rope that doesn't break. Um, you know, there's different ways of diagnosing these different things like American foul brood, European foul brood, and um, things like American foul brood. If you get it, you have to burn all of your equipment because it'll, it's got spores and it'll spread to the rest of your uh, apiary. So I would say just um, keep an eye out for anything that doesn't look uh, normal and then just sort of, you might even just google if if you have like a a discolored larvae or something because there's so many different ones it's hard especially when you're just starting out to recognize something right out of the gate um i'm gonna try to blaze through this because i just realized how late it is um seasonal considerations you can feed your bees in um pollen patties in march or maybe late february if it's if you have a warm day and this stimulates uh brood rearing so you can get your colony up and running because they sense that there's forage available. Um, you don't want to take your insulation off too early if you put insulation on over the winter. You want to wait until it's consistently warm to uh, to take it off because you don't want them to have, if one night gets really cold, it could throw them for a loop. Um, you want to watch for uh, swarming, signs of swarming in the early spring. Also, Something you should be considering now is making sure you have a water source available. Um, bees do not like clean water. I tried that when I first started. I I filled this big tub I got with clean water and I put little corks in it. It was so nice looking and they wouldn't touch it at all. Um, they really like, um, they seem to like water from stones. Like if you have like rocks, um, they like to kind of be able to get in there. And I think they like the minerals as much as they like the water. And uh, they like they like to drink off of moss. Um, some beekeepers will add salt and lemongrass oil to attract them to it. Lemongrass oil is very effective. Um, the salt, I think, just helps with the mineral, the mineral aspect. Um, but they also we have a, a wooden a wooden planter that um, when we water the plants that are in it the it seeps out onto the concrete and they're always hanging around the bottom of that drinking off the wood drinking off the 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 cement and um so they really like drinking out of you know stone it seems like and kind of dirty dirty water not fresh water um in the spring if you get a new package you can feed um one-to-one -one sugar syrup that just uh, one part sugar to one part water. It just um, simulates nectar. So it uh, helps them get started on building their comb. Um, if you, somebody mentioned this last time, if you, if your bees are running really low on food and you're really worried, they're not going to make it until the forage comes. You can, there's recipes online for making um, fondant candy boards that you can put on top to have like a solid food source that they can eat. Um, two to one sugar syrup, two parts sugar, one part water is, um, is we use that in the fall because it's it more resembles honey, like finished honey as opposed to nectar. So that was, we use that in the fall just to help get their honey stores up before they go into winter. Um, any honey sugar or honey, uh, sorry, any sugar syrup that we make, we always add just a tiny splash of honey be healthy uh, it's got the lemongrass scent and they just are really attracted to it. But I will advise don't add as much as the bottle says because um, it just turns them off. It, they put the dosing is way too much on that. I would literally just like a quick tip of the the bottle. It, it'll smell plenty strong. It'll it'll um, invite them to the syrup without scaring them away. Um, and this is what it looks like when we feed the pollen patties in the in the uh, early spring to stimulate brood. And then when I came back, you can see that the patty's halfway gone. 
Um, you might see cleansing flights. This is where bees poop uh, on, a, on an unseasonably warm day in the early spring. All the bees finally get to go out and relieve themselves. So you might see little yellow spots all over cars and everything else. That's, uh, that's their cleansing flights. They just went out to, uh, to relieve themselves and, and usually gets washed off by the next rainfall. So um, summer, you want to keep watching out for mites and keep watching out for swarming. We kind of already talked about this and pretty well over time. So I'm going to skip to the, the next thing. Um, in autumn, you just want to make sure that your mites are controlled before going into winter. Um, so you want to do your mite treatments, uh, feed the two to one sugar syrup so that as soon as the bees that are coming out, the winter bees that are going to be your bees that get you through winter, as soon as they come out, the bees can immediately fill that cell that they came out of. They can backfill it with, um, it'll be sugar water or honey, but that's all that's available because there's no forage usually at that time of year. So, um, you're just helping them fill all the leftover cells as many as they can to prepare for, for winter. Um, all the overwintering stuff that you do, you want to have it in place by Thanksgiving as a rule of thumb. Uh, it's just a good thing to remember. Like I got to have my hive ready uh, to basically be sealed up and left alone for the winter by Thanksgiving. Um, so we use um, a quilt box. I'll show you. We use a quilt box, a foam insulation board. I'll show you all these things. The Be Cozy insulation wrap. Um, we put a piece of corrugated plastic on the roof to keep the the snow from um, falling into like between the hive and the insulation um, and also to keep the rain off the, the landing board and the snow off the landing board. Um, let's see. And we also use a, um, uh, a quilt box, which I'll show you how to make here in a second. Uh, we talked about all these things already. Oh, wind protection. You do want to make sure that, um, you have wind protection in the winter. The Bee Cozy Wrap kind of helps with that too because it, it wraps insulation all around them. So all the cracks are protected from, from a breeze. Um, you want to protect from condensation. So when the bees heat up in the winter, they create a lot of condensation, which will stick to the inside, the ceiling of the hive, and then it will drip down onto the bees. And when it drips down on them, it gets them really cold and then they can die. And one sign of that, if you have a colony die, when you go in in the spring and you find them dead, if they're covered in like mold, like if they, you know, you can kind of tell they got like wet and then just sat there. Um, that's a sign you have condensation issues. Also, you'll see like mold on the top of your, uh, the ceiling of your hive. Um, also, we use a mouse guard, which is this. You just put it up against the, um, the entrance and it's got little nail holes so you can nail it down. I usually don't nail it down too far because I got to be able to get it off uh, if I need to. Uh, but it keeps the mice out because mice will take up residency in your in your hive. Um, I thought they would eat the comb and the honey and all that, but the one time it happened to me, they they ate the wood, they ate the frames, <laughs> um, and they can build a little nest in there. Um, I already mentioned the Thanksgiving Day. Um, oh, yeah. And so depending on where you live, if you live in Hawaii, you probably won't need to do any of this stuff. If you uh, but if you live where there's a, a solid winter, you'll probably have to do most of these things. Um, so maybe ask your local beekeepers what they do for winter if you're um, not sure. So quilt box. This is what I use to prevent condensation. It is I took a you can buy these, by the way, pre-made, but I just used a a box like for a hive box in this case it was a medium hive box and i drilled some holes in the side and on the inside of the holes i covered it with um like a wire screen so that nothing could get in through the holes but except for air and then i stapled a tea cloth to the bottom of the box and then i filled it up with um pine shavings to absorb the um condensation um and so you fill it about two thirds full and uh supposedly i don't i don't understand the science of this but i'm told that the pine shavings wick up the moisture to the top and then the moisture escapes through the the vented holes so this is what it looks like with the the uh, tea towel tea cloth 
um, staple to the bottom. And I staple it, um, the, if it'll cause uh, the, the pine shavings will cause there to be a dip down, it'll way down in the middle. And so you want to, you don't want it to be like flush with the bottom of the box. I always staple it to the inside a little ways up to account for the, the, uh, hanging that the, uh, pine shavings will cause. Um, oh yeah. And better be, if you go on the better be website, totally for free, they have, um, a manual on there that you can just read online. It tells you exactly how to make a quilt box. So you step by step. Um, and then in the winter, uh, just take a break. You don't need to inspect the bees. Um, if there's a warm day, um, you might, you know, peek in the top. Um, if you are, if you want to see if they're in there, you can put your ear up to the, to the uh, side of the hive and listen for buzzing. If you don't hear anything you can give it a couple gentle knocks on the side and usually you'll hear some buzzing um on the inside and that's a sign that your bees are are surviving um there are cameras you can use that are heat sensitive where you can see the bees they're you know their cluster if you want to go all out i don't have one of those um but they exist um if there's a fresh snow this is always one good thing about snow if there's a fresh snow you can look outside and see if there's dead bees on the fresh snow. And that's actually a good sign because that means that there are still enough bees living in your hive to be removing dead bees from the hive and throwing them out. So that's a good sign if you see a you know a handful of dead bees um, outside your hive on a fresh snow. So you know that it was just recently, recently done. Um, and then honey harvest uh the moment we've all been waiting for so um Ty, uh, can we address really quick a couple of questions that sure. came through the chat sure. do you have issues with ants i don't but i've heard that people do um and those people usually get um hive stands that have you know say they have four legs they'll take um like an empty soup can four empty soup cans and they'll put one on each of the legs of their hive stand and they'll fill it with motor oil. And that's how I've been seeing people um, prevent ants because they can't get up. They end up getting in the in the oil. Um, but I've never had an issue with ants here, thankfully. Hey, another question was, would buying someone's old or previously used setup be a bad idea? <sighs> um, I would say it depends. If you, if it's from like a really knowledgeable person uh and preferably somebody that's kind of small scale so they they know like what each box was used for and they can tell you like i've never had any disease in my apiary um then i would think that would be okay i've i've uh i've bought it before from somebody i knew um that i trusted um but if you if it's just some random person and they're like i don't know then it might not be worth it because um you could have some spores of a disease on there that could cause you issues long-term. All right, that's the last question. Okay, so when removing honey from a hive, um, you see the flow hive thing. Uh, it I was I actually found it kind of appealing at first, but then I realized that it doesn't really do anything to account for how much money it costs. Um, so their whole thing is that you can remove honey without disturbing the bees, but um, you don't have to disturb bees even in a regular hive in order to take honey. They make things called escape boards. This one here probably costs like $35. This one over here, the Porter Bee Escape, that tiny one costs only two or $3 and it fits into a regular inner cover into that little hole in the middle. And uh, basically what you do is you put this board under your honey supers that you want to take the honey from and the bees go down and you can see in the bottom photo, they crawl down through that little circle. And then the bottom of that board is above that. You can see the, the triangle shape. So they crawl down through there and then because of how it's designed, they're not able to figure out how to get back up into the honey super. So basically you put this escape board on or the Porter Bee Escape on and uh, you let all the bees, you just give them, you know, uh, a couple days. And 
in a couple of days time, all the bees will have left that super and gone down into the rest of the hive and they are not able to get back up. So a couple of days later, you come back and you take off that super or multiple supers and there won't be maybe two or three bees that never, that never left, but there's, it's basically empty. Um, so you don't have to disturb bees even with a regular beehive. You can just use one of these. And like I said, the Porter Bee Escape only cost a few dollars. It's a little plastic device. You put it right down in the middle of the inner cover. I usually put painter's tape around it because it pops up a little bit out of the um, out of the inner cover. Um, but those are both options. There's also a fume board, which is if you want something quick. I've never used a fume board, but I've seen plenty of people do it. Um, it's basically this foam board that comes with the spray that is a natural thing, but it's something the bees really don't like the, the smell of. And you spray this fume board with the spray, and then you put it on the top of your, um, of, of your hive. And it has a, a black lid that really, um, takes the heat of the sun and, and heats up this fume board. And, uh, that fume, those fumes go down into the hive and it pushes the bees. They get out of there immediately. They hate the scent. So they crawl out of the honey super and down into the rest of the hive as low as they can go. And then I think that one only takes minutes and then you can take the honey off. And um, again, that might be a little more disturbing as far as like you're making them go down, but you're, um, but it's very quick and uh, you don't actually have to like forcibly remove bees from each frame or anything like that. Um so again, I don't use the fume board. I use the, I just give it a few days and use the escape board. Um, but you don't have to disturb bees to get honey. So you can take the box off. Um, if uh, if we talked about this the last time, but if, if honey is like 80% capped with, you know, 80% of the honey on a frame is capped with wax cappings, that's when you know that it's okay to harvest because the bees are, you know, they were happy with how uh, the water content of that honey, they weren't worried about it fermenting or going bad. And that's why they capped it. And so as long as 80% or more of the honey is capped, um, you're free to harvest it. Um, they also make devices that are really cheap. I have one here somewhere. Um, oh, here it is. Refractometers. I think this is like $20 on Amazon. Um, if you want to know for sure the moisture content, you just uh, take some of the honey and well, first you have to calibrate it with olive oil and uh, it, there's instructions on how to do that. And there's a little screwdriver that helps you calibrate it. Um, it usually comes perfect anyways. It comes already perfectly calibrated, but then you take your honey and you put it on this little screen here and then you put this down and then you just hold it up to the light. There's no electricity involved. You just hold it up to the sunlight and it will tell you the moisture content of your honey. So if you wanted to know 100% certain, um, you could use one of those. And um, sometimes you'll have, you know, at the end of the season, they're, they're, um, you'll have a frame of, of honey and it's like, wow, that really looks dumb, but they didn't cap it. And I'm really worried about harvesting it because it's not capped. You can just test it. And sometimes it's like, you know, it'd be like 15%, which is well under the, you know, what is the 17.1% um that's safe and then you, then you know you can actually harvest that that honey because the the moisture content is fine um so i think i mentioned this in the previous section but when bees bring the nectar back it's like 85 percent water and then they have to dry it out by fanning it and uh, they want to get it down to like 18 percent or less uh before they cap it and so that's why you want it because they don't want it to go bad they don't want it to ferment and so here's the guidelines you can see in the photo that there are anything less than 17.1% moisture content is safe regardless of the yeast count. And then you can go on from there. But all of my honey has been like 14, 15% um, moisture content. And this is what it looks like when you look into the refractometer. This is what you see. So this is like 15.9% water content. Um, once again, it just costs like 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, it's not an expensive device, thankfully. Um, and once honey's in the jar, it doesn't, uh, there's not enough airflow for it to dry out anymore. So, um, so once you put it in there, this, the moisture content is pretty stable. Um, 
Oh man, I five minutes. Okay, so to extract honey, uh, you need a uncapping tool. Um, you need uh, an extractor. You need five gallon buckets, um, preferably with honey gates at the bottom. Um, you need a double sieve or a cheesecloth and then jars to put your honey in. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. I'll just show you the video. Oh, maybe. Okay, so you take the frames out that's more than 80% capped with honey. You remove the cappings with an uncapping knife. And then once you get both sides uncapped, then you put it in an extractor, which you'll see here in a second. And then once you get the extractor full, you spin it. This is a hand spun extractor. And then it goes, all the honey drips out into the bottom of the extractor. And then you run it through a double sieve before it goes into a five gallon bucket. And that just takes the wax particles out. And then from the five gallon bucket, you can go straight into your, into your honey jars. And that's, uh, that's how that's all done. Uh, there's other methods. You can crush the beeswax and just strain the, the honey out with a, a cheesecloth. Um, you can cut the comb and, and serve the whole comb, but you have to freeze it for a few days to make sure there's no um, wax moth uh, eggs or anything in it. Um, you can take the cut comb and put it in a jar and fill the jar with honey. That's called chunk honey. So it's the best of both worlds. Uh, it's normal for honey to have different colors like this here. And the, the light colored one is our, our spring honey. That's mostly black locust. And then the dark one is the um, Japanese knotweed honey. So it's just the color of the nectar from the flower um, that causes the color. It's also normal for it to crystallize. Um, you'll notice like some honeys, they crystallize really easily. Uh, there's two primary sugars in honey. There's uh, fructose and glucose. And the more glucose heavy it is, the faster it will crystallize. But it's completely normal. It's um, just a natural process and it's still good to eat. Um, well, if you want to... Um, let me see. If you want to bring it back to liquid, I thought I had a frame on this. If you want to bring it back to liquid, you can just um, put the glass jar inside of a uh, some hot water, but not boiling water, and just let it come back to a liquid state. Um, rendering beeswax. I thought I'd have more time to get into this, but basically, uh, you just put an inch of water in the bottom of a pan. You do. Uh, put the beeswax in the pan with the water, you heat it up, it'll come to a boil, all the wax will melt. And then you, once it's all melted, you set it off the burner. You never leave it unattended because beeswax is highly flammable. And then um, once it cools, it'll separate. There'll be the water at the bottom, debris in the middle, and then, um, and then wax at the top. And uh, you can either just scrape that debris off with a knife and keep redoing it, or you can pour it into another container with a sieve and let the sieve remove all the debris. And you just have to keep doing it. Sometimes it takes three or four cleanings before the wax looks good. There was a video, but I might skip that just to get to, you can see that on Instagram if you wanna see how to render beeswax. Um, propolis is this bee glue that they make out of tree resins. Um, that they use to seal up the hive, all cracks in, in the hive and uh, any holes. And um, it's also got uh, antimicrobial properties. So they use it to prevent infections. And uh, the National Institute of Health says it's composed of 50% tree resins, 30% beeswax, 10% essential oils, 5% pollen, and 5% various organic compounds, just debris basically. Um, and so they, they use that to protect their hive from intruders and from disease. And uh, you can actually harvest the, that and you can put it, you can find recipes online where you put it in alcohol and um, make little tinctures out of it that are really good for you for like um, wounds or people make throat sprays for it. So just so you know that there's another thing you can use it for. Um, as for safety, um, when bees sting you, they, uh, their stinger gets stuck in your skin because it has a barb. Uh, I just wanted to say it's best if you can scrape that out instead of pulling on it because the the venom sac is still attached to the the stinger and it will if you grab it you're squeezing more venom in. So um, I usually use like a credit card or something with a flat edge to scrape it out. Um, 
if you a little bit of localized swelling can be normal but if you start noticing you have hives um you might want to uh prepare as though you might have like an allergy and, and talk to your doctor about getting and maybe even talk to them in advance about having an EpiPen. Just have a plan, basically. Uh, what am I going to do if I have if I've never been stung and now I get stung and I have an, a reaction? Have a plan for your own safety to uh, make sure that nothing nothing bad happens. Um, so yeah, maybe have like an ice pack on hand, have some Benadryl on hand, if possible. Get an order for epinephrine. I don't have that, but I've been doing it for a while and I have. You know, knock on wood, I've been okay. Um, but you can also develop allergies over time. So just because I've been okay doesn't mean I'll always be okay. There's another beekeeper near me who's been keeping bees for years, and she just had anaphylaxis when she um, got stung recently, and now she has to go through uh, venom tolerance training or something. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is um, there's a lot of talk online about uh, recently about concerns about uh, native beehives because so many people got into beekeeping um, when when uh, colony collapse disorder came out and now some people are worried that honeybees are going to take over all of the uh, the forage that native bees would use and I think that's probably dependent on the location there's probably more beekeepers in certain areas than than others um, but I just wanted to say that there's a lot of things you can do for local pollinators to native pollinators. There's uh, lots of wildflower mixes that are geared towards your native pollinators. You can get mason bee houses. I'm actually making them now. Um, I'm not selling them, but I'm, I'm making them for myself. And um, you can get those in your, in your um, yard. And uh, just wanted to make sure I didn't ignore that problem completely that you um, maybe look into your native pollinators and try to help them too. I did talk to um, University of Guelph, the the head guy over there, uh, Paul Kelly, who I mentioned earlier. And he was saying that while becoming a beekeeper was a common thing to do during that era, it was even more common to start a pollinator garden because most people don't want to be beekeepers. They just, they want to do the, I'll plant the flowers and then I'm good. Um, and a lot of those flowers and those seed mixes were actually geared towards uh, native pollinators, not so much towards honeybees. So he doesn't, he thinks the problem's a little blown out of proportion. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's the, what I came, came out of uh, my talk with him thinking. So, but I still think it's worth looking into um, your native pollinators because they're good to have, obviously. As for resources, these are my favorite books uh, on bees, ABC and XYZ of bee culture. It's a beekeeping encyclopedia, uh, honeybee biology and beekeeping by Dewey Karen. I have that book. Um, beekeeping for dummies, I read when I was just starting out and I found it really helpful. I don't actually own it, but I checked it out from the library and I, I found it extremely helpful. So you might find that helpful too. Uh, if you're in the urban setting or suburban, Keeping Bees in Towns and Cities by Luke Dixon is really good. Uh, as for magazines, there's two main ones, and they're both different enough that I recommend both. Um, bee Culture and American Bee Journal. Um, and then for YouTube channels, University of Guelph, Paul Kelly, as I mentioned, uh, his channel is amazing. Like there's all the videos are uh, just really helpful and um and clean cut unlike mine and uh michael palmer he's a excellent beekeeper he doesn't have his own channel but you can find his lectures on um on youtube bob benny uh another big time beekeeper with tons of helpful information sorry i got a two-year-old chomping at the bit uh cayman reynolds from tennessee's bees he's on youtube tons of good information and randy oliver uh runs scientific beekeeping the website so um that's really good um yeah that's the end i just wanted to say uh thanks to everyone the the course is completely free i did have two or three people ask about donating uh you certainly don't have to um but if you wanted to there's the venmo information another thing that's helpful um that doesn't require any money is just um sharing posts liking posts um sharing our page with people that's super helpful and um, 
Uh, oh, yeah. And my wife is suggesting I ask if there's any more questions. Let's see. I guess, is this how I read them? Let's see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're welcome. I really appreciate you guys coming. It's, uh, I didn't know how long that would take. I thought this one would be much shorter than the first one, and I was totally wrong. Um, so now I know that for, for next time. But yeah, if you do want to see how to render beeswax, um, there's a video of it on on uh, on our Instagram page, and you can watch it from beginning to end. Oh yeah, and there's a, a video of harvesting honey on there. I think the honey harvest video and also the preparing the bees for winter video are both pinned to the top of our Instagram page. So you can see like all those um, things that we use to overwinter the bees. You can see them um, right now at the top of our Instagram page. You can watch me put them in place and explain each one. Um, so what else? Anything else? I think that's uh, it. Unless you guys have any more questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you can always reach out to me um, anytime. Um, I, yeah, I have a little, uh, what do you call it? Like a teleprompter down here. Um, uh, Facebook page, you can message me there. I'm pretty active on there and trying to keep up. And um, they said thank you to you too. Um, said you're welcome. Um, Instagram, you can email me. Uh, and I, I try to respond to everyone. So really appreciate it. Happy Sunday. Go watch some football if you're into that. So thank you guys. Take care.